Weather modeling and, and climate modeling have been you know, very traditional users of high performance computing. The models are the laboratory for these scientists. So they will inject some level of CO2 into the atmosphere and see what happens. An artist that discovers a new process or a new material, same thing's happening in computation. People are constantly embarking on a sense of discovery. That's what gets people excited about science. And they say, here's a new tool that can actually let me address my problem from at least a somewhat new angle. These models are obviously getting you know, very sophisticated at this. They're able to have many knobs, if you will, that, that can be turned and then see what happens. Computational science is the use of computing in the broad, including all aspects of computing, the data, the CPU, and so forth, to address scientific questions. Primarily, this is through some sort of simulation. The idea is that you're using a computer to represent some sort of state of reality. The computational scientists that we have in Cray and also that we meet at customer sites they tend to come from a lot of different backgrounds. It's not that they're all meteorologists or oceanographers, for example. They can come with backgrounds of just pure mathematics or physics or you know, any number of areas. Welcome to the Cray booth here at uh, Supercomputing 2011. We had a couple of great announcements today. The first and foremost is right behind you, it's Blue Waters, and it will be one of the best machines in the world for science. It's really designed to do a broad range of scientific applications. For many disciplines today, you know, computational science, you know, numerical experimentation really underpins what the scientists can do. Sure. That's very true for weather and climate. Climate and weather are long-scale phenomena that by their nature we cannot observe on human scale very easily. In fact, I work with some people that do modeling of the ice sheets over Greenland and Antarctica. For these types of simulations, they're looking at literally a quarter million year run-up time to figure out what might happen over the next few hundred years into the future. There's a lot of work by a number of the leading centers and leading scientists around the world to develop new formulations that are much more scalable. And what I mean by scalable is you know, their ability to use more and more processors simultaneously. Particularly, what this means is they can include more stuff. They can include more physics, they can include more of the processes that they know underlie the phenomenon that they're studying. It also means that they can crank up the resolution. Look at cloud systems. You know, these are not on scales of 50 or 100 kilometers. These cloud systems would just disappear almost of that level of a resolution. So in order to try and simulate the physical processes that do occur in clouds, you need to get down to that level, a few kilometers. But again, computationally, this is quite a challenge today. So they're doing it at a finer spatial resolution, say a grid size that goes from 100 kilometers on the side for a climate forecast to 10 kilometers on the side to a climate forecast. Today, to run a cloud-resolving model in any reasonable amount of time, you need to be using you know, close to 100,000 processors simultaneously. But I think the more important changes are actually in the software, essentially the processes that we use, the instructions that we give to the systems to do the modeling. What we're seeing is that thanks to the continued increase in the performance of the computer hardware, which we see all the time, you know, you see your cell phone now having the same compute power that a PC had just a few years ago when you carry it around with you. So this is happening, of course, in computational science as well with the, the biggest supercomputers and much smaller systems that you might use as a research scientist on your desk. Climate models a decade ago essentially were just representations of the atmosphere. Then they evolved to have coupled models where you have atmosphere and ocean interacting. And then they've now evolved to include things like atmospheric chemistry and sea ice and land models. So what's happened is that they've become very, very complex and very multidisciplinary. But essentially the software and the hardware are advancing in step. And the goal overall, of course, stays the same, which is to do better modeling, to better reflect the, the realities that we're trying to understand. They're community models. They're developed by scientists 
throughout a country or within a center or even cross national borders.